with teams completing the scrapping of the old vertical cryo tanks. Other teams at Starbase continue working on the new launch tower. Ship 31 resumes its test campaign, and B-14.1 is returned to Sanchez. And a new announcement from Elon that Flight 5 is just four weeks away. Now let's dig into this week's update. Friday morning, we saw test article B14.1 being removed from the orbital launch mount in preparation for being sent back to the build site. Scrapping of the vertical cryo tanks also continued with the removal of tank 3 from the farm, which was sent down to the scrapping area to be cut down. Crews got right to work with their torches, cutting the bottom dome from the tank and hauling it out. The load spreader was also removed from B-14.1 after sunrise as workers finished their preparations to send the test article back to the build site. The test article was then rolled away from the launch mount and moved to an out-of-the-way location at the launch site ahead of its return trip. Later in the afternoon, B-14.1 was moved closer to the launch site's D-2 gate and remained there for the rest of the day. A new steel wall section for the second launch tower was delivered to the launch site. Once it's in position, it will be welded to the other segments and filled with concrete. A self-propelled modular transporter was also brought to the launch site. The SPMT left the launch site about an hour later, carrying a load of counterweights. Half an hour later after that, the transporter returned with a different set of weights for the large cranes at the launch complex. At the same time, another wall section for the new launch tower was delivered to the launch site. The barge from Kennedy Space Center arrived at Port Brownsville, carrying two orbital launch tower segments as well as the tower's chopstick arms and carriage components. Looking back at the launch site, we can see workers starting to install the plumbing in the base of the new launch tower. While workers were wrapping up the demolition of the storage tank, the launch pad operations team began testing the Raptor spin startup gas systems on the orbital launch mount. Each engine has its own spin start system, and during ignition, they bring the turbo pumps up to speed. Since each of the outer engines only need to be lit once, putting the engine start hardware on the launch mount reduces the weight of the booster. Test article B14.1 then started its journey back to Sanchez on Saturday. The test article left the launch complex through the D2 gate and headed up Highway 4 on an hour-long journey past the build site. Once it arrived, the test article pulled into the Sanchez site entrance for storage. Back at the launch site, the load spreader was attached to the last vertical cryo tank, with the crane holding the tank's weight while they detached it from its footings. A prefabricated floor frame was lifted and brought into the base of the second launch tower. However, it seemed the frame section didn't fit properly and the lift was aborted. A few moments later, workers made a second attempt to install the floor frame. This time it went right into place and the steel was soon installed in the tower base. The last vertical cryo tank was removed from the farm shortly before midnight and workers began cutting through the fill and the drain lines. Crews began removing the lower dome from the tank on Sunday, performing the demolition process one last time. With the electrical repair work on Ship 31 now completed, the High Bay Bridge Crane picked up the two-point ship lifter as workers prepared for the ship's journey to the Massey Outpost. The empty ship lifter support stand was then brought out of the High Bay and relocated to Sanchez. At the launch complex, several beams were installed in the floor deck inside the base of the new launch tower as iron workers build out the lower levels before the tower segments arrive. The first of the two SPMTs were then moved into the high bay early in the afternoon. The second SPMT went in an hour later. One of the column sections was removed from the base of the second tower as workers rotated and repositioned the column base before reinstalling it a few minutes later. While workers were installing pipes in the new tower segments at Sanchez, the cryogenic proofing and ship thrust simulator stand was rolled into the build site and set down outside of High Bay. The High Bay's crane then brought the two-point lifter up to Starship 31. Workers soon had the lifter connected to the ship. The two SPMTs that were brought into the bay earlier in the day were removed to make room for the cryo stand, which went inside a few minutes later. <laughs> 
Following a few hours of prep work, Ship 31 was finally taken off its workstation and placed onto the cryo stand. Workers then spent the rest of the evening securing the ship to the testing hardware. Once everything was in place, the crane was detached. Ship 31 was then rolled out of the high bay to await the scheduled rolling closure and journey to the Massey outpost. The ship rolled out without raceway covers, giving a rare look at the plumbing and avionics wiring harness. The harnesses were replaced after the electrical system caught fire during testing. Scrapping of the last vertical crowd tank resumed shortly before midnight, with teams cutting off and dragging out the barrel sections for scrap. Ship 31 then left the build site and began its journey to the Massey Outpost on Monday, heading up Highway 4 for multiple rounds of cryo-proof testing. Crews worked at a fast pace to scrap the final tank, rapidly taking down one barrel section after another. The issue with the column bases was apparently more serious than previously thought, as workers began pulling all of them off the new launch tower. Meanwhile, SpaceX's Grove Crane was attached to the ship quick disconnect interface panel arm to begin installing replacement parts. Demolition of the final crowd tank was nearing completion by 10 a.m., with the second to the last barrel section being cut loose and dragged out. The last barrel section was cut out less than two hours later, and the load spreader was removed, completing the demolition and removal of the eight vertical tanks from the launch site. Two hours after the third column base was removed, the final base was removed from the second launch tower. The ship quick disconnect work platform at Tower 1 was extended, giving workers unimpeded access to the arm. Crews soon got to work disconnecting the liquid oxygen supply line from the tower arm and using the crane to pull it free from the surrounding framework. A new liquid oxygen line was then hoisted up to the tower arm and lowered into place inside the main swing arm. Once it was in place, the hose was carefully draped over the supporting frame for the quick disconnect panel. Workers then fastened the line into place. Over at the high bay, an SPMT brought some counterweights into the building. I sure would like to know what you think they're for. Knock yourself out in the comments below. The glow of arc welders could be seen through the scaffolding at the base of the second launch tower as the seams between the tower segments were welded shut. A very clearly labeled booster load spreader was brought to the build site in the morning, driving through the site and stopping in front of Mega Bay 1. Early on Tuesday morning, while it was still relatively cool outside, workers began setting up for a concrete pour at the new office building. At the launch site, the base of one of the previously removed tank cryo shells was lifted off its foundations and set down at the staging area for scrapping. Crews then began to reinstall the column base segments on the new launch tower. After installation of the first base, a second followed shortly afterward, with crews moving on to other things once it was in place. After six hours of pouring, concrete placement for the office building's fifth floor concluded for the day and workers began packing up the concrete pump truck. A two-ring barrel section featuring an access hatch in the lower ring was rolled out into the ring yard before being brought into the Star Factory. Back at the launch complex, the crowd tank shell section was cut in half. Workers also cut the barrel down vertically to make it easier to break down. Another pre-assembled floor beam was brought into the base of the second tower, but it also ran into trouble and the lift was aborted. After a bit of adjustment, workers made a second attempt to install the floor deck, and this time everything went smoothly, with the floor setting down at the top of the tower's base. After a short stay in Star Factory, the two-ring section was brought out and rolled into the high bay. Workers then finished cutting the cryotank shell in half, dragging the bottom section out, and then setting the top down. Ship 31 began crowd testing at the Massey outpost in the evening, with a simultaneous fill of both the methane and oxygen tanks. 45 minutes later, the frost lines began to recede as the ship's methane tank was drained, while the oxygen tank was only partially emptied. With the ground support equipment seemingly unable to empty the LOX tank, the ship underwent a lengthy depress vent in order to empty the tank. Returning to the launch complex, the tower elevator cab was hoisted up and set down inside the base of the second tower. The first launch tower segment began its journey to the launch site on Wednesday morning, rolling down Highway 4 under police escort. 
It's been almost two years since the last tower section was rolled out to the launch site, and a lot has changed since then. The new segments are much more complete than the segments of the original tower, which will help the second tower come together quicker and enter service sooner. The tower section made the journey to the launch site in a little under an hour and was soon brought in and set down near the tower's base. While the tower segment was rolling out, concrete placement was underway on the fifth floor of the office building, picking up where things left off yesterday. Six hours later, the concrete placement was finished and the pump truck was packed up. A ship quick disconnect panel setting on a pallet was an unexpected sight outside a high bay as workers wrestled with the rough ground to move the panel around. Over at the Massey outpost, the aft flaps were deployed on ship 31. Now that the tanks have all been demolished, the vertical crowd tank load spreader is no longer needed. Crews soon had it removed from the launch site. A brand new support stand for a two-point ship lifter was delivered to the build site. The stand was actually meant to go to Sanchez, so it was soon backed out and rolled to its correct destination. The Saren's own CC-8800 was moved closer to the tower base, positioning itself to lift the first segment of the new launch tower. The crane was then moved even closer about 40 minutes later. Workers began to attach lifting eyelets to the top of each column on the tower segment. These are what the crane's hook and load spreader will be attached to when the segment is lifted onto the tower base. The 4th of July saw SpaceX's LR-11000 moved away from the orbital tank farm now that the scrapping work was completed. The crane made its way to the staging area near the D2 gate before being moved to the location of the old landing pad. The first tower section was moved as well, being repositioned to make way for the Saren's crane to be laid down in preparation for the upcoming storm. The SpaceX crane began to lower its block and boom, laying down flat for safety against high winds as workers began to prepare Starbase for the forecast weekend arrival of Hurricane Barrel. The tower segment at the pad was then repositioned away from the base later in the afternoon. Switching over to Florida, Falcon 9 Booster 1078 finished its stay at the Port Canaveral docks on Friday and was laid horizontal for its return to Roberts Road. Booster 1081 lifted off in a spectacular twilight launch from SLC-4E at Vandenberg Space Force Base, carrying the classified NROL-186 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. The payload is suspected to be 20 satellites for the Department of Defense's Star Shield constellation. Support ship Bob returned to Port Canaveral with the fairing halves from the Starlink Group 10-3 mission on Saturday. Doug also made its return to port, carrying the fairing halves from the GOES U mission. Signet Warhorse 3 returned with just read the instructions in Falcon 9 Booster 1062 after its record breaking 20 second launch with Starlink 10 3. Sunday saw Signet Warhorse 1 tow a short fall of Gravitas out to sea ahead of the Wednesday launch of Starlink Group 8 9. Bob then headed back out to sea on Monday, joining a short fall of Gravitas in support of the Starlink Group 8 9 mission. Falcon 9 Booster 1062 was lifted onto the dockside stands on Tuesday for stowage ahead of refurbishment. Right on schedule, Falcon 9 lifted off just after midnight on Wednesday, carrying Starlink Group 8-9 into orbit. Booster 1062 had a short stay at the Port Canaveral docks, being laid horizontal for the return trip after less than 24 hours on site. Firefly Alpha successfully launched Noise of Summer from Vandenberg Space Force Base. This mission was part of Firefly's commercial launch services qualification efforts with NASA. Bob then returned to port with both fairing halves from the Group 8-9 launch on Thursday, wrapping up a relatively slow week at the Cape. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.